Uh, no, no problem. I'm John Haig. I am the co-director of the Most of Our Romani Center for Business and Government. And I want to thank all of you for coming. Um, we are extremely fortunate today. This is in part of an ongoing <clears throat> kind of series of conversations about technology and regulation. And we started these a couple years ago. Um, we have an all-star cast. Um, uh, I'll start with Gene Kimmelman, who's worked at the DOJ and works on competition policy questions, uh, has been doing that for a number of years, many years. Um, and then we have another individual, John Sallet. Um, and John Sallet is not with us today because John is actually one of the lead litigators in the Google antitrust case that's going on in Washington, D.C., and a little bit preoccupied at the moment. Um, and then we have Tom Wheeler, who is the former chairman of the Federal Communications Commission. Um, and we are going to talk today, uh, as the headline said, says <clears throat> AI is too important not to regulate and too important not to regulate well. Um, a quote from Thunder Pakai, and I don't know how many of you know, he's the uh, chairman CEO of Google. Um, so um, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Tom. Uh, we will go for about an hour. Uh, we will have a little longer. We'll have questions at the end. Um, I would remind you that if you have a question, you have a little thing in front of you. This is to help people, particularly who are listening by Zoom. Um, if it's a red light, it's not on. If you push the button, the green light is on. Um, and with that, I will leave it uh, to Tom. Thank you, John. Uh, and it's great to be back at the John Haig Luncheon Club. Clearly, you all are uh, enjoying the repast today. Um, as, as John said, I mean, when I was looking for, okay, we're going to talk about AI today. We're going to talk about the regulation of AI. I thought it was incredibly significant that the CEO of Google, who has long been in the forefront of AI, and who has described AI as more important than fire, the discovery of fire and electricity, would make this kind of a comment that calls for regulation. And that the person calling for this regulation has for a long time been fighting the idea of government oversight. So I thought this was a title that kind of wrapped everything that we're going to be talking about today into one tight package. So when you look at AI, you got to ask yourself the question, why all of a sudden, all this fuss? AI is not new. We'll talk in a minute about Alan Turing and going back to his ideas about AI, but GPT, the generative pre-trained pre transformer, is exemplified by ChatGPT and Google Bard and other kinds of services, is the breakthrough. Classical AI was all about big data, a huge search of a huge amount of data produced a pretty good guess. Generative AI traces itself back to a 2017 paper that literally back to Google was written by a few Google engineers in which they made the observation that attention is all you need. That whereas classic AI was looking at huge amounts of data and trying to sift through it and make a pretty good guess. If you're building a process that tries to resemble the neural network that we have in our brains, we don't sift through all of the information in the world to make a decision in our brains. We pay attention to the relevant data. And so generative AI does that. It focuses on producing an output that is related to the question. And, um, and in so doing, one, 
has moved AI out of the back room and the programmer's priesthood of folks who knew how to do the complex programming necessary to make AI work and allowed us to chat with it. I think the greatest thing that sucks us all in is when you watch chat be GPT, for instance, and it slowly gives you the answer. Just as we are talking, I slowly make this point, whereas you go to a search engine or something like this and boom, everything is there at once. It's like chatting, it's like carrying on. But the problem is that this really cool technology exacerbates existing problems while at the same time creating new ones. And I'd like to posit a thought here today that we think of AI not as software, but as infrastructure. It is the next generation of infrastructure. In other words, the layer between services and users. And that as such, it becomes a gatekeeper. And as such, the essential infrastructure of the 21st century becomes machine cognition. Now, so I back, so I, as I was trying to prepare this, I back up and I say, you know, this has earth shaking overtones for us today that also echo the challenges of the ancients. It's like Janus, you know, the, the Roman god of transitions who was simultaneously smiling and frowning because it's got incredible great promise and incredible great peril. It is like Hydra, the mythological Greek multi-headed monster because it has multiple heads. There is no such thing as AI. This is what AI is. And those multiple heads have multiple manifestations. The Janus we talked about, great opportunities for advancement, huge opportunities for apocalypse. This is a statement, a one sentence statement, 350 AI experts band together to produce a one sentence statement that says the priority needs to be mitigating the risk of extinction to humanity that comes from. Okay, so this is the, we got it, we got something here that's got two faces. It also has multiple heads that it makes existing problems worse. It creates new unknowns. And probably the most interesting thing is it's constantly growing new heads through open source large language model models. And we'll come back and talk about that in a second. So we have all of these interesting technical results, but human decisions have never been more important. This isn't a matter for the gods. This is a matter for us. The instructions for AI are determined by humans. The algorithms are trained on data that humans created. And we'll come back to this point multiple times today. You can't talk about AI 
without also talking about the basic incentive of human nature to advantage one's self. And therefore we need to be thinking about what are the behavioral standards? How do we have some kind of independent oversight of those standards? And how do we develop an enforcement plan? And this is our challenge as humans to make the decisions about this cognitive technology. So I decided to have some fun. <clears throat> and I decided to chat with ChatGPT and ask some basic questions that might help inform us. So one of the first questions I asked was, hey, can you pass the Turing test? Alan Turing, British mathematician, computer scientist, 1950s. He called it the imitation game, but the question was, if you have a computer and a person and you pose the same question, you will have artificial intelligence if they both come back and give you the same kind of answer. So I asked ChatGPT, can you pass the Turing test? And here's what it said. I'll let you read it. Turing test sets a high bar for AI, et cetera, et cetera. I can perform well in certain aspects. There's still limitations to reach true human level understanding and intelligence. Progress continues. Future iterations may come closer to passing the Turing, Turing test, but it remains an ongoing and complex challenge. When I got this answer back, I said to myself, look at this. There is human worthy humility in here. Oh gosh, really? I'll probably not yet. Okay. There is computer worthy precision. And there's human like personalization, the use of the term I. Yet this profound development is devoid of meaningful oversight. So I went back to the Oracle and I said, tell you what, compare the regulation of AI to the regulation of a toaster, a common household appliance. And it gave me a whole list of things, but this is the one that I thought was most interesting, the potential for misuse. Hey, the risk for a toaster is relatively low. At, at worst, you might get a shock. But the potential for misuse of AI is vast. Deep fakes can spread misinformation. Predictive policing systems can reinforce biases and surveillance systems can infringe on privacy rights. This is Chat GPT saying, let's talk about regulatory issues associated with a household appliance and you. So I said, okay, let's have the Turing test versus the toaster test. Here are the things that toaster, the people who bring toasters to the market are required to do before they can sell them. It has, everything used in it has to be Food and Drug Administration, food grade compounds, as in the same kind of safety that would go into a food item. The FCC requires that it not interfere with the spectrum. Underwriter Laboratory sets safety standards and each of those three require independent third party laboratory testing to assure that safety before it can be released. And then there are packaging and labeling rules 
that have to go on, on the box. Here are the equivalent tests for AI. Oops, as in nada. So we've got this incredible opportunity and peril, technology, zero oversight, when compared with something that's in everybody's kitchen and what the government does to oversee that. And so it was in that context that I thought that Pichai's statement was a regulatory Rubicon, that it is a departure from what has been big tech's traditional opposition to regulatory oversight and the invitation to begin a dialogue on specific regulatory ideas rather than no, there should be none at all. <laughs> the only question is, how do we do that? I just finished saying it's hydra headed. How do we do? How do we deal with the hydra? And let me just quickly bang off three of the multiple hits. As I said, the Hydra is constantly growing new heads and expanding AI through open source models that are proliferating around the world now. We'll talk more about that in a second. One of the heads is how it extends things today that are, that are already illegal and takes advantage of the fact that the issues that we have not paid attention to for the last couple of decades of the digital era, privacy, competition, truth, et cetera, we have not paid regulatory attention to, are made worse. And lastly, the explosion that everybody says, okay, we, that we, we wanna make sure we don't have self-replication or suddenly the machine takes over building machines. But what are the other unknown unknowns? And again, if you think of AI, not as software, but as essential infrastructure, essential infrastructure that has the ability to go rogue. And that's what's been happening with open source. The internet was built on open source software as opposed to proprietary software. Building an AI model is very expensive. But after it's built, if you release that model so that others can have access to the source code to manipulate it, they can produce a good enough, fast enough, cheap enough form of AI that can then be further targeted for specific purposes and can end up being very pro-competitive. How do you break the hold of the big companies, big AI? You know, when, when Meta released their Lambda 2 into the open source community, it exponentially increased the speed to which these Hydra heads could grow. And the question is, <clears throat> have we produced AI democracy where we've democratized the AI process or anarchy? Back to humans have to answer that question. But at the same point in time, it's anti-oversight. The, the great advantage 
that it's not hoarded by a handful of companies is also the great disadvantage. How do you oversee two guys and a dog in a garage in Estonia? And so we have AI in the wild. This is a leaked, this is an excerpt from a leaked Google memo about open source in which the author says from a Google perspective, we have no moat to protect what we're offering. The barrier to entry for training and experimentation has dropped from the total output of a major research organization to one person, an evening, and a beefy laptop. Microsoft reportedly spent $100 million building the data center for chat GPT. Good enough AI can now be done by a beefy laptop. And this is the kind of reaction it's been having in government. Top government officials are freaked out by the national security implications of having large open source AI models in the hands of anyone who can code. This is how Salesforce chose to explain this in a big full page ad. And we just need to remember that it wasn't so very long ago that social media was hailed as democratizing dialogue, but it had no sheriff. And we know where that went. Open source being hailed as democratizing AI. Again, but without a sheriff. So the question becomes, what are ideas for the sheriff to enforce? And it strikes me that in order to address that question, we have to be as innovative as the developers of the AI of AI themselves. That we are stuck in industrial era thinking, that we are stuck with traditional industrial era thinking regulatory agencies, and that we have failed to import digital management practices into government. I want to share with you a video of Eric Schmidt, former CEO, executive chairman of Google, current advisor to, um, to uh, the Defense Department, current funder of uh, AI fellows um, in key congressional offices. He was asked on Meet the Press about what we do about regulating AI. And this is what he said. You've described the need for guardrails. And what I've heard from you is we should not put restrictive regulations from the outside, certainly from policy makers who don't understand it. I have to say, I don't hear a lot of guardrails around the industry in that. It really just as I'm understanding it from you, comes down to what the industry decides for itself. When this technology becomes more broadly available, which it will, and very quickly, the problems are going to be much worse. I would much rather have the current companies define reasonable boundaries. It shouldn't be a regulatory framework. It maybe shouldn't even be a sort of a democratic vote. It should be the expertise within the industry helping sort that out. The industry will first do that. 
because there's no way a non industry person can understand what is possible. It's mm -hmm. just too new, too hard. There's not the expertise. There's no one in the government who can get it right, but the industry can roughly get it right. And then the government can put a regulatory structure around it. As you might imagine, You've described the need oops. for guardrail. As you, as you might imagine, I was kind of gobsmacked when I saw that interview. So he says, there is no way a non-industry person can understand what's possible. Really? I mean, we did split the atom. We did send men to the moon. We did develop the internet. But more importantly, I don't think there are, I, I think there are few members of Congress who can understand jet propulsion or explain Bernoulli's principle as to why planes fly. Yet we can regulate construction and operation of aircraft. I mean, one of the challenges that I had when I was chairman of the FCC was I was constantly being told that this digital world is so complex, it's almost magic. And if you touch it, you'll break the magic. So let's have the current companies define reasonable boundaries. Let's let them be the pseudo governments to make the rules. Really? How's that been working for you thus far when it comes to the web and what we've seen there when the government yields to the companies to make the rules? So that takes us back to the Pajai comment. And we got to ask the question, can industry self-regulate? Before I was chairman of the FCC, I ran a couple of industry organizations. And for one of them, a wireless industry, I built wireless self-regulatory code. Um, so I've written self-regulation. And I can tell you there are two big holes in it. One is it's only as good as the weakest link in the group putting it together. And the second is that you have to have enforcement. And the reason, and, and because it's only as strong as the weakest link, and the weakest link says, no, 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 we don't have any enforcement mechanism. So much for your regulation. But that's me and my experience. We're talking about AI. So once again, I went to chat GPT and I said, hey, tell me about self-regulation. And it said, well, you know, profit motives can sometimes get in the way. And unless there's a clear case or strong public pressure, companies might be slow to regulate or to modify their platforms or products. Really? This is what the Oracle is telling me. And Americans are no dummies. 82% of Americans in a recent poll said that they do not trust big AI to regulate itself. Agree or disagree? Tech company executives can't be tr trusted to self-regulate the industry. 82%. 86%. This, by the way, is a study that was conducted by the Artificial, uh, the Artificial Intelligence Policy Institute. 86% believe the apocalyptic warnings. And 56% if they are asked, would you support having a federal agency regulate the use of artificial intelligence? 56% of the American people say, yes. So what's happening in that regard? Well, the Congress is having lots of hearings and lots of discussions, but the argument has boiled down to the traditional one that we have seen for the last couple of decades of the digital era, which is regulation harms innovation. We'll come back to that point in a minute.
The Biden administration has been doing a lot more than the Congress has been doing, that's for sure. They came up with the AI Bill of Rights, which was an aspirational list of, here are the kind of things that people ought to be thinking about. Here are the rights people ought to be protecting. Then NIST, the National Institute of uh, Standards uh, at the uh, Standards of Technology at the Department of Commerce, came up with a risk management framework, which was absolutely terrific. That said, here are the risks in AI, and here's the kind of management you can put in place to mitigate those risks. And please do it, it's all voluntary. And then recently the White House got the big AI companies to sign commitments to manage the risk that moved beyond the aspirational to pledges that appro approximate this, but is very generalized and very hard to enforce. And later this month, in a week or so, the administration is going to come out with a very detailed executive order, which if rumors are to be believed, when, it, when asked about, what, when, when having to make the choice between regulation and, and protection, I'm sorry, regulation and innovation tilts towards the old argument that regulation harms innovation. So that's what's happening here. European Union has the Artificial Intelligence Act, the United Kingdom is doing their thing. China is deep into AI development where it's less about protecting the effects of AI as it is promoting the uh, political power of the Chinese Communist Party. We're gonna hear more from Gene on this on Wednesday, so I won't go there. But how should we be leading as Americans, American policymakers? is a model for the world. And I guess I come down to the fact that this hydra-headed monster is too broad a concept to say, well, here's our AI policy. We've got to parse it into bite-sized chewable pieces. Um, and so I'd like to suggest a series of principles for AI oversight. The first is, as I said a moment ago, there are things that are already illegal that are made significantly worse by AI, but they're still illegal. This is a fabulous quote from the chairwoman of the Federal Trade Commission, there is no AI exemption to the laws on the books. And the Biden administration has put together the FTC, the EEOC, the Department of Justice, and the CFPB um, to use their existing powers to move against AI enhanced bad things that are extension of the bad things that, that already exist in consumer scams. As you can see, consumer scams, criminal activity, discrimination. Those are wrong, those are bad, those are illegal. We have enforcement mechanisms, we can use those. Okay, well that's the low hanging fruit on AI enforcement. Let's look at the next opportunity. How do we clean up the mess that we have allowed to accumulate? The digital challenges that we have been sweeping under the rug for the last couple of decades. This is a fabulous quote, I thought, from Yuval Hari, who, as you may recall, wrote the book, Sapiens. And it ought to be our touchstone. And I'll be our North Star in this discussion. 
because the issues that we have been struggling with and failed to deal with for the last 20 years, personal privacy, competition, truth, are all exacerbated by AI. I mean, personal privacy is, if you've ever posted anything on the web, congratulations, you're in the database and they're using <laughs> your information to create the, the models. There's a serious concern in the competitive force, and Gene can talk more about this tomorrow or at Wednesday. Serious concern when you're talking about competition, that the models will learn to talk to each other without directly talking to each other. But if you program a, an AI model to do your pricing for you, and that AI model sitting there watching what's happening in the marketplace and watching that if you don't cut your prices, the other guy's not gonna cut his prices. That there is a huge opportunity for collusion, willing or not, intended or not, as these models just do what they're hired to do. And that's draw conclusions from the data that is available. So you've got new forms of any competitive collusion driven by AI. And then, you know, we move, we've moved from algorithm determined distribution of untruths to AI created content at scale. So the first two things we talked about here, the low hanging fruit, that which is illegal is still illegal. The things we swept under the rug that we need to be dealing with because they are the threshold issues that are gonna be dealt with in AI are achievable. We can get there, we don't wanna do this. But then we venture into the unknown. What are the AI unknowns for which we are unprepared? Tristan Harris, one of the early Googlers, and now I think a, you could call him an online ethicist, had this fabulous quote. He was going around making a pitch about warning about, about AI. What nukes are to the physical world, AI is to everything else. Well, there's an unknown. And when we come to deal with these unknowns, this quote always comes to mind. I was sitting with Madeleine Albright one day before she passed. We were talking about the impact of technology on diplomacy. And she says, you know, the trouble is that we define 21st century issues in 20th century terms and propose 19th century solutions. <laughs> and, Madam Secretary, consider that stolen, okay? Because it's a great way of where we're, so here's where we are with, with AI right now. We're defining it in terms of what we knew yesterday and today. And we need to move beyond industrial era thinking and confront the challenge with equally innovative thinking. You know, everything but government has changed as a result of AI. So let's talk about how we go forward into this unknown. Uh, I think it is really significant. And again, the title of this presentation indicates that the tide has turned. And, and how are we going to deal with 
that tide. Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, the creators of Chat JPT, GPT, said this to the Congress, I think if this technology goes wrong, it can go quite wrong. We want to work with government to prevent it. The apocalypse of AI favors big AI. Because if we focus on something that is down the road, could be horrific, and get ourselves wrapped around that axle instead of what are the things that are going to affect us today and tomorrow and the day after and deal with those, then we've missed our opportunity. I think it is terrific. Sam Altman, and Brad Smith, and Sudar Pichai have all said we need to do something. Here's what Sam suggested, and Brad Smith of Microsoft has made a similar. We create a new federal agency to license the creation of AI above certain levels, establish safety standards, and have independent audits to assure compliance. These are good faith efforts, good faith suggestions by good people. They just happen to also reinforce the corporate position. This idea of licensing, I once ran the federal government's largest licensing program for the spectrum, for the airwaves. Licenses protect incumbents from competition. It diminishes the competitive imperative to innovate. And it does all of this and only gets in return a very blunt permission-based instrument instead of the kind of agility to look at outcome-based issues. It recalls the Cold War containment policy, you know, the, where the, the strategy in the in nuclear, in the, in, in the, the Cold War nuclear era was, well, we'll just contain the number of countries in, in that have access to nuclear weapons. This is saying we will just contain AI. By the way, in our company and our big computing facilities, but it's already in the wild. The nukes are loose. And, and, and again, it is the fact that these folks are stepping up and saying we need to do something. I want to huzzah. These are good people. The fact that proposal just happens to advantage them takes us back to the first thing we talked about, right? Was that nobody has repealed the law of human nature, which says, how do I advantage myself? And there's nothing wrong with that. But we need to have the dialogue about what is it that we're going to do. And to my way of thinking, we need to focus on what are the effects of AI, not what is the AI itself. Um, the hist I believe that the, that the lesson of history is that it's never the primary technology that's transformational, but it's secondary effects. Think about it. Pick any moment in history. The effect of Gutenberg's printing press. Well, it was the Reformation. <laughs> okay. 
the effect of the railroad, the industrial revolution. Okay, you go right down, it's the effects, not just the technology. So our challenge, if we're gonna have outcomes-based oversight, is how do we identify the effects and how do we identify the risks associated with those effects? Traditional regulation is about micromanagement. And yes, it is anti-innovation. We need to move our thinking to how do we have risk-based analysis and how do we do that for AI? Well, this is how the EU is talking about doing it, which is a really interesting approach where they say, look, we got things down here at the min at the bottom that are, yeah, it's a risk, but it's a minimal risk. Hey, the fact that you've got an intelligent spam filter, do we need to regulate that? How big a risk is that? But we go up here and we got threats to personal safety, threats to national security. We need to do something about that. And how can we, and we can debate these till we're blue in the face, but we need to have that debate. How do we say, let's base our policy on the effects that are produced by the technology and the risks represented by those effects? And for five years now, Gene and I and Phil Revere have been advocating something we developed here at Harvard, um, the creation of a digital agency in the federal government. And, um, and I found it fascinating in the survey that I showed you early on, 56% of the American people say, hey, we need a federal watchdog. So let's talk about if we're gonna look at effects and if we're gonna have risk-based, how the hell are we gonna manage that thing? We start with cloning the management techniques of the companies themselves. Um, this is where I pause for shameless self-promotion. Today, uh, I have a new book coming out, literally today. Um, called TechLash, Who Makes the Rules in the Digital Gilded Age? And in that, I developed the concept that, that in the late 19th century, when industrial regulation was first put in place, Congress looks around and they say, geez, how do we manage these things? And so they say, well, so we'll, we'll manage them. We'll set them up to run just like the companies they're overseeing, okay? How did those companies run? Well, they were top-down micromanagement. The guy on the shop floor, and he was a guy, the guy on the shop floor had a set of rules that he had to follow. He had a supervisor that checked, make sure he was following the, 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 several of those guys were following the rules who then were, had a manager that looked to make sure that all oh, the, the guru of industrial management was a guy by the name of Frederick W. Taylor. Taylorism was the scientific method of management and Taylorism specifically said to remove initiative. If you're going to be able to scale and have mass production, you've got to remove initiative. So, so when we want to create industrial companies, uh, industrial oversight, we cloned that model. And that's why that model ends up being anti-innovative. What we have to do is have a new structure that thinks like the companies, the digital companies. So, so what are the rules for digital companies? Transparency, 
risk-based, oh my God, risk-based and agility. How do we bring those kinds of concepts and apply and, and identify issues and what might be problematic um, uh, behaviors and then bring together, again, steal an idea from the industry. How did we get from 1G to 2G to 3G to 4G to 5G and now 6G phones are coming? An industry-based standards setting process in which the companies said, what are the negative outcomes that could happen if I do this and how do we agree to mitigate those to begin with? We need to have the same kind of approach that goes the next step and says, and how do I mitigate the negative behaviors that result? The agency reviews, amends, approves, whatever this ends up being. And then we get, to, we get a third party group, which is the let's keep things going here uh, for ongoing review. So just like you go from 1G to 2G to 3G, somebody needs to be saying, hey, you know, there's a new technology or a new marketplace development. We need to adjust this way. And then we need an agency to be an expert resource for other agencies. So I think we can say that aspirational guidance and self-regulation are not enough. That thinking that the world will wait to see what America decides is delusional. That believing that a one-time one fix like licensing is sufficient is insufficient. And we are existing in a moment where there is agreement that there must be oversight. I can't begin to tell you what a huge change that is from where we were in the past. It is time now to seize on that, to have the debate of the specifics of the kinds of things we're talking about here to impose both responsibility and liability. One of the things that has happened for the last two decades in the digital environment is we have allowed the digital companies to make their own rules and not have to worry about the consequences. So just for kicks, I went to chat GPT again and said, will you please describe to me your power and do it in the style of a Shakespearean sonnet. And this is what it produced. And it's clever, but look at the ending. GPT-4, a tool of matchless might, yet man's own soul must guide it right. I think that's what this says. Thanks. Thoughts, questions? Yes, ma'am. Right, if the thing in front of you, well, well, okay. Okay, let's let's see if it works. It's on the green and you're good to go. Go. Okay, let's go. You want to pick it up? Just sit it down. Oh, okay. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, many thanks for your presentation. Uh, so. Some of the thoughts which came to my mind is that I really appreciate your conclusion, which is aspirational guidance and self-regulation is not enough. And also how you emphasize that some of the experts that we have put forward were coming also from the corporate field. And so there was this underlying conflict of interest. And one point I would like to emphasize on is I think that 
as we are all navigating those new challenges, especially with the advent of generative AI, I think there's a huge confusion between AI expertise versus AI policy and regulatory one, which is overlapping, but which is not exactly the same thing. And I think that there's also the construction of a narrative, which tries to make regulatory effort paralyzing, both in terms of the risk that we're focusing on. So for example, when we focus on catastrophic or existential risk, which seems so far off that there's no way of fully grappling them, but also in terms of the regulatory incentives, which for example, doing an AI regulatory agency internationally for something as polarizing as AI, I think is an extremely hard step forward. And from this perspective, I think it's also useful to remember that we have actually already been here, that for example, like the false dichotomy between innovation and regulation is a false one, and it should not be seen in terms of a zero sum game, but rather in terms of a spectrum. How, for example, in the car industry, to be able to have a widespread adoption, we have been able to do speed limits and safety belts, for example. Um, and the last one, which I really appreciate is that we don't need to start from scratch. So I appreciate the emphasis on the AI Act, on which I was, for example, working this summer, um, which I think could actually be a first building block for which you know, we could both see the translation for the American regulatory system, but also more widespread AI governance. So some thoughts I also think, on see I how we can translate. Violent agreement. Perfect. <laughs> um, and on that last point, make sure you come Wednesday because Jean has some really good thoughts on this issue. Yeah, but I guess the question is, how would you see the translation for a first comprehensive AI regulation as the AI Act in the American system? Um, I think that we're lagging. Okay, number one. Um, I, I think it's. I think that pyramid approach is a terrific approach. I think it needs to get encapsulated in the kind of digital agency that we've been proposing. Um, and you know, the fascinating thing is that the headline is, oh, there needs to be no digital agency. That's the least important thing. The most important thing is how that agency operates and whether it clones the management techniques of the companies it's supposed to oversee rather than continues to operate on the way things used to be. I think that the pyramid is one approach to that risk-based, which has got to be at the core of how we address things. Jason, sir, we'll go one, two, three. There's somebody over there. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, I agree with you, but a little bit more pessimistic. One thought and one question. Uh -huh really like what you said that we have to be as innovative as the industry and that's exactly the point that i get really pessimistic because not only the government the large companies actually struggle to do that and i have a couple tiny thoughts on that the founders are extremely focused focused to a point that Many startups do not do more than two things. Probably Elon is a very special exception. And they last much longer than many of the senior executives in large companies or any initiatives or the governments. So my question is, if we take the last slide that you said, which I wholeheartedly agree, and I think that is the way to go, how can we make this change management actually works? Because when the government turns offices, when the big companies have senior executives with the board of governors and a board of directors that all have special interests in different way, how is that practically going to balance the startup, which is driven by one person, one vision in most of the cases who would do that for 30 years in an unhumane work hours? So I'm really putting that into a practice. How can we think about that change management if we really want to make this agencies work. And last but not least, I wonder, this probably will be an American case, but I thought it will work in many, many of the other governments that if we really clone what the startups and they do, wouldn't this make also this department or agencies more powerful than the others? So, um, I mean, those are terrific observations. And I think you're, you're hit in the right direction on, on all Government is people trying to figure out what works for the most people. It's a, 
terribly, terribly imprecise kind of process. Um, and so the first thing that you have to recognize is that you can't get caught in a situation where the perfect is the enemy of the good, right? You're, you're living in an imperfect environment. But, you, but to your point, you have to act. Um, and, um, and yes, there are going to be consequences of those acts of the, you know, one of the things that I get, I think it's, so there's two, there's two principal arguments that you hear that I used to hear when I was a regulator. One is that regulation kills innovation. The right kind of regulation won't, okay? It's industrial regulation that has that impact. And the second is, oh my goodness, the impact that this will have on those poor struggling startups that I'm trying to crush every day of the week. <laughs> and, um, and uh, but I think that this is a, a, an iterative process that we have to start. We go, all the points you raised are incredibly legitimate. We have to start the process. And unfortunately, the door's been opened to have that difficulty. Okay, somebody was over here was next. Sir. I like your uh, thought about the outcome of the distinction. on the hypothetical way of regulating, let's say the uh, unwanted uh, outcomes in social media that AI may have produced. How could that be done in practice? What might a regulation look like? So um, so to the, to the previous question, um, it will be, regulation always ends up being an amalgam. Um, one of the things I learned when I was chairman is that um, there's nobody who ever comes into your office and says, hey, I know what I want to do is against the public interest, but it's in my interest, and so let me do it, all right? They always come in and say, if you'll take this, if, you, if you'll go stand here in the corner and tilt your head and squint and look at what I'm proposing, you'll see why that's in the public interest. Public interest is a fungible kind of thing. So, the, so to answer your question, I don't know what the specific answer is, how you put it together. But the public interest, the assembly of, 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 a, of regulatory oversight of the, for the public interest is the taking of multiple ideas from multiple components and putting them together in something that not going to please everybody, but it's going to start the process going. And what we've refused to do thus far is to start the process. And we need, and that's why I kept, if I've used the word agile once, I've used it 20 times in this presentation. Why we have to be agile in order to respond and not respond to the market and respond to ourselves and the market's response to ourselves. So I can't give you what they, what's the answer, but it's going to be a bunch of pieces. Yes, ma'am. See you, John. Just, yeah, just punch it once. And, no? Um, hi, uh, John. Fantastic presentation and um, really appreciate this idea about, you know, this agile responsive body. I have two questions for you, and I know we've spoken a little bit about this before, but what would, you know, you've been very generous to the five, top five companies and their like good faith effort. Yep. Um, but what, what do you think um, a body like this would require of these, um, you know, large language model providers um, to do uh, in order for, you know, this sort of a model to work? So I'm thinking things like transparency or, you know, oversight. As long, my, my hunch is that as long as it was about, you know, just like having this licensing um, agreement, these companies would very regular, like readily be, you know, um, there um, would like cooperate and, you know, be like, all right, let's do this. But if you propose something like this, I'm curious, you know, um, whether you think that they would support something like this and then what would be- Great question. Part. 
Okay. Um, and my second question oh, my okay. <laughs> is essentially like, you know, I know we're not talking about this in this framework, but what do you have to say about, you know, how we currently govern cybersecurity issues? So we have this whole industry, which is like, you know, you have bad actors and the whole industry is just making sure that the good actors are in front of bad actors all the time. Do you think that's something that could be applied to AI as well? So um, first question. Um, Brad Smith, the president of Microsoft, has endorsed the idea of a new agency like Gene and I proposed, which, by the way, has been introduced uh, in the Congress, um, as has Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, it's a long step from endorsing the idea of an agency to endorsing the details of the implementation of that idea. Um, but um, but I'm hopeful that AI will provide the impetus to finally jumpstart that activity, um, and um, and I'm also very mindful. One of the things I write about in this in this new book is that. The dominant technology of the mid to late 19th century was the railroad. They were abusive SOPs. The farmers organized in 1867 the Grange to lobby to get railroad regulation because they were getting squared. It took 20 years before the Interstate Commerce Commission was created, the first federal regulator. And it was almost 20 years before Teddy Roosevelt gave them the teeth that they needed. This is not, this is not a snapshot. This is a moving picture. This is a long, long time. Secondly, your question about cyber. You, I know you were just asking that to provoke me. Um, <clears throat> so so um, I spent the first Obama term on the president's intelligence board. Just fascinating position where you might say you see cyber from both sides. And when he asked me to become chairman of the FCC, I looked and I said, my God, 100% of cyber attacks at some point traverse a public we have responsibility to oversee those networks. What are we doing to make sure they're secure? So we put in place a, a process that tried to have the kind of agility that I've talked about here. And it was built on the NIST cybersecurity framework. Um, and uh, that in our heads against that because we it was it was the, the Republicans on the commission said you don't have any authority you don't have any authority the Republicans in Congress you don't have any authority you don't have any authority. And I said excuse me the first page of the FCC Act the, the Communications Act says where our job is to protect the public safety this is how we're doing it. Trump administration comes in one of the first things they do is kill it. We need to have cybersecurity oversight. I tried to do the kind of structure we're talking about here in creating that kind of oversight. It is possible to do. Okay, we got here and then, yes, Marlon. Okay, yes. Uh, I really appreciate um, how you oh, pointed you, out. Okay, Sorry, I was pointing okay. behind, but this is okay. <laughs> You know, he, he with the mic controls it. Go ahead. And then we'll go to the gentleman behind you. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. I'll be quick. Uh, so uh, I really appreciate the idea that you said, uh, you know, Congress didn't know like much about the technology of, you know, railroad or whatnot, like members of Congress, right. yet they were able to regulate. Right. But my question is, we're not um, in the 1800s. 1900s anymore, not even 1980s. We're in an age of, you know, information where things change much much faster than before and even with social media even with you know cybersecurity, I, I feel like regulations are not at this point comprehensive enough to catch up with those things but those are already 
you know, things from the 2010s, like, you know, social medias and whatnot. How do, do you see, you know, a need for the federal government to have more people with the special, like the knowledge special specialty to come in so that they can respond faster to these changes? We'll Any, we have, the, the, one of the problems is, you know, is we have, we have uh, industrial era statutes, industrial era structures, and a muscle memory that has developed amongst those who work at the agency, who are good people. I mean, I'll just, you know, those who oversee them in Congress, those who review their, their decisions in courts, there's a muscle memory, well, we've always done it this way. We need to have digital DNA and a fast response kind of concept inside the federal government. And um, that's, we don't, but we need it. Will that happen? Slowly, it'll happen. Sir, behind you. So I think the closest parallel I see right now between the framework that you're proposing uh, is the FDA. It's a lot about expert. It's a very specialized field. It's a risk-based assessment uh, in terms of regulation. And it's also an area where the FDA is trying to balance, you know, uh, healthcare concerns versus innovation. Uh, and my question is, when it comes to that form of real-time expertise-based regulation, is there a risk for a revolving door as we have seen in the case of the FDA in the making of the opioid crisis where, because as you have sure. argued for, when we're trying to make the agency more like management and there can be greater uh, potential for a revolving door, would it create a risk, as you have um, said, that people are self-interested? Would, would it create a risk where people will move around between industry and the regulator yep. that we're proposing and that create a real danger in yep. terms of longer term sustainability yep. of the regulation? But, so first of all, It's not, what I'm, what, what I'm proposing is not like the FDA. FDA gives you permission to deliver a drug. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not saying that I need to say, hey, I want to do this. Give me permission to do it. That's a, it's a, it's a, but, but, but what I am saying is here are the four corners of the code that you're going to follow. Point two. So I spent my career in industry. Yeah, I ran the Cable Television Association. I ran the Wireless Association. Uh, I was a VC. I started several companies. Um, and when President Obama announced that he was going to appoint me chairman of the FCC, all hell broke loose. Is this a fair, fair description, Gene? All hell broke loose on exactly the point which is, he's a tool of the industry. Oh my God, you know, it's gonna be a terrible situation. It's the revolving door. Oh, we've got to stop. At my confirmation hearing in the Senate, I was asked this question by one of the senators. <clears throat> and I said, you know, Senator, I said, um, uh, I hope that I was the best possible at that the industry could have had at the time. But I was representing them. And if I'm confirmed for this job, my client is going to be the American people. And I want to be the best possible advocate they can have. The point of the matter is that nothing has revealed the law of human nature. No one's revealed but we need to be real careful about who we're putting in jobs. Now, you know, I think I was able to do a better job as chairman because I had experienced these things on the other side. And I think we need to have people who have had that kind of experience in government. <clears throat> and we need to have those kind of people leaving government, delivering the message inside corporations. But we need to have in the process an expectation that let's understand when you're in this job, what your priorities are. So be the best possible advocate for the American people. 
Yes. Yes, thank you, Tom, for the uh, presentation. Uh, my question is going back to what you said about the Biden administration trying to do it with the cross kind of like cross department approach, bringing like different departments to uh, tie the AI enhanced crime with the existing uh, law book. I'm curious if if like the idea of like having this independent agency ever was a part of his plan or like why did he choose this approach? the cross-department approach rather than setting up a, a new agency? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, the, uh, I do know that it's a lot easier <laughs> to say, hey, you four agencies, I want you to go do something and it is to create a new agency and that the statute already exists and is capable of, of, of dealing with it in those limited circumstances. Um, and, um, I think we're going to begin to see this idea get more legs in the Congress. Well, thank you, everybody.